Hello everyone and welcome to this Integrated DNA Technologies webinar on detection of low frequency variants using molecular tagged adapters. My name is Dr. Hans Packer and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's presentation. The presentation today will be given by our Director of NGS Scientific Applications, Dr. Mirna Yarosh. After completing her PhD in chemistry at MIT in 2004, Mirna began work at Helicos Biosciences where she played a key role in development of the world's first commercial single molecule DNA sequencer. In 2010, she joined the startup Foundation Medicine Inc., where she led development of library preparation and targeted sequencing technologies. And in 2012, Myrna moved to the west coast of the United States and she joined the startup 10X Genomics, where she first led the biochemistry efforts there and then later focused on applications for the company's link read technology. In this presentation today, she lasts about 30 minutes, and following the presentation, she will answer as many of your questions as possible. Uh, you can type in your questions at any time during or after the presentation, and you can do that by typing them into the, the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. And there's a little arrow, you can click on that, make that larger, you can even pop that out, um, and make, make it a larger window to type the question and make it easier. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we'll have a question and answer portion, I'll read your questions to Mirna, and we'll get through as many of them as possible. And if we don't get to your question, then we will uh, respond to you by email. So you will uh, get a que uh, your question answered if you do ask one. Um, all right. Uh, so if you do need to leave early today or you want to revisit the webinar itself later, you can. Uh, we're, we're recording the presentation. You'll be able to find it on our Vimeo channel and our YouTube channels, which are shown here. And we do have uh, a good deal of content already on those channels for other NGS applications as well as other molecular biology applications. And then also the slides are already posted on our SlideShare site. And uh, if you don't have, if you don't want to remember all of that, you know, we will also be sending you an email that will contain links to the video and to the slides. So a quick uh, outline of the presentation for today. I'll start with some review and background, um, talking about the growing need for accurately detecting lower and lower frequency variants. Uh, one of the key applications where this is especially important is liquid biopsies, so I'll give a quick uh, overview of what those are, why they're important, and what makes them challenging. Uh, and then also a, a quick background on library preparation and, and target enrichment to kind of get everyone on the same page in case they uh, are not already doing these things. Uh, and then we'll get into the meat of it for the experimental results. So I'll uh, discuss some of the um, new adapters we've been working with that have unique molecular identifiers, or UMIs, also known as molecular barcodes. I'll then talk about the model system we put together to be able to assess the accuracy of our variant detection um, at low frequencies, and then get into the analysis methods and the data uh, and accuracy assessment. Oops. Uh, so I think most people have probably heard of the White House Initiative for Precision Health. Uh, and the idea, idea here really is the uh, right drug for the right patient at the right time. Um, the graphic I've, I have at the bottom is from the National Cancer Institute. Um, let me just get my pointer here. Uh, and and um, really what this is showing is, is the ideal of doing a molecular characterization of each and every um, individual's tumor and then matching the, that tumor with the appropriate drug for those alterations. Uh, and this is especially important in cancer where uh, time is really of the essence for uh, rapidly progressing disease and also a lot of treatments can have significant side effects. So you really don't want to waste time with an ineffective treatment or a treatment that causes um, uh, terrible side effects and, and has no benefit. So lung cancer is, is one of the poster children for um, molecular diagnostics. And so I'll walk through that as, as an example. Uh, so kind of walking through, initially looking at lung cancer in a phenotypic sense in terms of where the cancer is, and that progresses then to histology-based subtyping where you might be able to uh, say something as squamous versus adenocarcinoma. But even within these two broad uh, histology-based groups, there's a huge diversity of the molecular drivers behind these tumors. And you give 
there's a sense of those in, in these two pie charts. Um, so here a big um, wedge for adenocarcinoma would be uh, KRAS mutations, but there's also EGFR, there's RET, ROS, uh, even BRAF, which is more classically known in uh, melanoma, um, ALK fusions, et cetera. Um, and what I'm showing on the right in this table is some of the clinical and um, treatment implications of various different um, mutations and why it's important to, to know what those are in order to get the right therapies. So um, EGFR, for example, uh, there are uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that um, EGFR mutant tumors might be sensitive to. Um, there's EMF4 ALK fusions, and, and those tumors would be sensitive to ALK inhibitors, but um, resistant to those EGFR TKIs. Um, HER2 is a classic uh, amplification in breast cancer, but can also be seen uh, in lung cancer. You can see that uh, here in the pie is actually somewhat significant. Uh, so that would be sensitive to some of the uh, HER2 inhibitors. Um, so it's clearly important to understand the molecular drivers of tumors, but it's hard, uh, especially in cancers where um, biopsies are invasive and it's hard to get enough DNA. Uh, so what I'm showing here is a study, um, I believe this was performed at WashU, um, and this column here is the percent of tests that were successfully completed. And so what you can see, if you have a large piece of tissue from a resection or an excisional biopsy, you get a high rate of successfully completing the, um, the targeted sequencing test. On the other hand, if you try to go for a less invasive biopsy or maybe it's a later stage disease and the primary tumor has already been resected, so you're going into metastases, maybe now you have a core biopsy or a fine needle aspirate, you can see that the success rate drops uh, below 50%. And the primary reason for this is not being able to get enough DNA from those, uh, from those biopsy samples. So now I'll go into one of the potential solutions um, for this um, issue of, sort of invasive biopsies and, and um, which is uh, liquid biopsies. So um, for circulating cell-free DNA is also known as a liquid biopsy. Um, it could mean various different liquids, but usually people are talking about uh, blood. So there's a fair amount of circulating uh, DNA in plasma, and when the tumor is present, it sheds some of its tu uh, tumor DNA also into the bloodstream. And so it's certainly much less invasive to do a blood draw than to do a tissue biopsy. And theoretically, it would represent the uh, more complete picture of the tumor heterogeneity because all sites, uh, all metastas metastatic sites, uh, would be shedding into the bloodstream and you'd get that more complete picture. Uh, also facilitates ongoing monitoring for uh, more personalized therapy so you can keep an eye out for uh, residual disease or the appearance of drug resistant mutations in the targeted therapy scenario. Um, so what, what I'm showing here is a picture of uh, tissue in an FFPE block and this is uh, really what the, the cutting edge of um, cancer diagnostics and molecular characterization was a few years ago. Uh, and it was challenging because you had uh, degraded DNA, small inputs, and a lot of the methodologies for variant calling were, were really more for genotyping applications with 0, 50, or 100 percent variant frequency. And, and now we're looking at you know, 10, 20, 40% uh, frequencies, and so there's a lot of progress made to, to do this well. Now we're moving into a regime where people would like to do this for um, liquid biopsy samples where you have a large amount of normal DNA in the bloodstream and you're trying to see uh, the small fraction of circulating tumor DNA, uh, and which would be present in, in under 1% in many cases, and so this is what that allelic frequency distribution would look like. So you can see you've moved from 10, 20 percent uh, down to single digits. And this requires 
significant advancements in both uh, sample prep um, methodologies as well as the analysis to be able to do this accurately. Um, so just a quick background now on library preparation and target enrichment to get everyone on the same page. Uh, so essentially library construction means getting your DNA sample ready for the sequencer. Uh, so in order to do that, most uh, sequencers uh, require a size range that's in the on the order of a couple hundred bases, maybe 100 to 500 base pairs, uh, because that's what works well with the sequencing chemistry. And then you also need a sequencer-specific um, sequences on either end in order to get, uh, for example, in the Illumina case, in order to get the cluster amplification on the flow cell. So this process of fragmenting and attaching adapters is, is what we would call library construction, um, and that gets you ready to uh, sequence. Uh, the, in the Illumina world, the way this is generally done is through a fragmentation, an end repair and A-tailing, and then an adapter ligation. There's some cleanouts and uh, amplification. This would be a standard single index adapter structure. This is called the Y adapter. Uh, P5 and P7 are the flow cell specific sequences. And then you have a, a sample index here, and uh, this is a priming site for sequencing. And your genomic insert in the middle. So for you know, getting back to this, this case of low frequency variants, liquid biopsies, uh, you, in order to see these low frequency variants, you're really going to need very deep coverage. For most people, this basically means whole genome sequencing is out. It becomes way too cost prohibitive to do it at uh, a few thousand fold depth. And for many, even uh, exome sequencing is, is not really an option at those depths either. And so focused targeted panels that are really uh, disease specific become especially important when you're talking about these uh, low frequency variants um, and you're sequencing to ultra deep coverage. So um, IDT has our uh, XGen lockdown probe technology to do this. What really um, sets these probes apart is that not only are they individually synthesized, but they're individually QC'd and normalized prior to uh, pooling uh, into your, your capture pool. Uh, so kind of walking through where these fit in the process, you have the library fragments here that we just talked about. There's uh, blockers to prevent daisy chaining. I'll show this a little more on the next slide. Um, and then these are the probes that are hybridizing to the specific target of interest and then getting uh, via their biotin getting pulled down on stripped out and beads. Um, in order to get this ultra deep coverage, over the entire region of interest, uh, this individual synthesis and QC uh, and normalization is really uh, puts you a step ahead in terms of uniformity and, and getting that deep coverage everywhere. Um, so this is a close-up of this structure. Uh, so there's a blocking oligo that goes to the universal adapter sequence. And the reason for this is that uh, without the blocker, because every library molecule has the same adapter sequence on it, um, you would pull down, you know, via hybridization in the universal region, you'd start pulling down uh, off-target fragments when you pull down uh, the on-target fragments. Uh, so that's quite important. There's cut one in here as well, which is um, small fragments of repetitive human DNA that um, helps to block those regions as well. Uh, so this is uh, an example of one of our ESI mass spec traces that we use for QC. What I have on the x-axis here is mass, and on the y-axis is intensity. And this is an example of a failed probe. Uh, so these are 120 mers, and uh, this would be the expected full length. And you can see a significant amount of truncated product. That would fail QC, and then go through resynthesis, um, confirm that it looks correct and full length prior to putting into the pool. So you can really be sure that all of the probes you intend to have for your target sequence are in fact there. And this is showing some of our exome data actually just to demonstrate how this um, is relevant for deep sequencing. And so although this is not uh, super deep, what you can see is 
um, thanks to a high on target percentage and a very uniform coverage of the target area, you can get uh, deeper and more even coverage of all of the targets. This is um, even clearer, I think, in the graph on the right. What I'm showing here is coverage on the x-axis, and then on the y is the percent of bases that get to at least that level of coverage. So the ideal plot here would be a step function, which is all uh, bases getting up into the uh, until you get to average coverage, and then it would drop to zero. That would correspond to a spike in the histogram version. Uh, so what you can see with other technologies is that you get a steady drop-off of bases that um, are at, at low coverage. And so these are regions where the, um, if, since the coverage is lower, the um, variant detection will not be as sensitive. Uh, whereas you can see here we have a, a really nice flat uh, region here uh, thanks to the uniformity of coverage. Okay, so now getting into the meat of things, I'll start uh, discussing the molecular barcoding for the adapters and, and what the data looks like. Um, so there are various different levels of error correction one can do uh, to improve sensitivity of variant calling. So kind of at the top with um, no error correction would be using amplicons with the same start-stop site for everything and no molecular identifiers. Um, in this scenario, you don't really know what a PCR duplicate is, what represents um, two reads from different unique starting molecules, so it's, it's difficult to do any sort of um, error correction or even gauge the true sensitivity uh, on a per sample basis. Uh, standard shotgun library with shearing and ligation has some built-in error correction in the sense that um, because of the random start and stop sites of the reads, you can uh, do some discrimination of PCR duplicates, um, and that allows you to get better sensitivity. Uh, particularly then as the coverage goes up and you um, want to go even more sensitive for your variant detection, you can then start to add molecular barcodes. So that what I'm showing here is a ligation UMI depicted by the different colors. Um, so when I should back up and say the true positives are green here and the false positives are red. Um, so now with the ligation UMI, you start to be able to see multiple reads of the same starting molecule um, and get better dis, uh, distinction between PCR duplicates and non-PCR duplicates. So that allows for even more sensitive detection. Going one step further, which I won't go into any more detail here, but just to um, mention it since uh, quite a bit's been published on techniques like this, uh, is duplex sequencing. And so this is where you have um, barcodes on both sides that um, basically will allow you to distinguish based on their orientation whether the read originated from the uh, initial top strand or initial bottom strand. Uh, that allows you to, in addition to correcting for sequencing and, and PCR errors, you can also start to correct for errors in the sample itself. So, for example, a depurination event, um, some FFPE damage, that kind of thing. So this, what I uh, have on the top here is a traditional dual indexed adapter structure. So you have a sample index on the P5 side as well as a sample index on the P7 side. Um, what we've done then is to add a molecular barcode or a UMI, unique molecular identifier, after the P7 sample index. Uh, so that is in this position here. Um, and I'll, uh, I think I've, in the next slide, um, in a couple slides, I'll show you then how the, that gets read on the sequencer. Uh, so then in order to assess how well these uh, UMI-containing adapters are working, we needed a good model system with known ground truth. Um, this is harder than it might seem initially, particularly to know with certainty when you have a reference call that it's really reference. Um, so what we did was to rely on the really excellent data from the Genome in a Bottle Consortium. Uh, this is a work from NIST for those that aren't uh, familiar with it. So they have a few highly characterized uh, normal samples, NA12878 and NA24385 are, are two of those. And so uh, what we have done is to 
mock up NA12878 as our normal and NA24385 as the tumor. Now if you have regions where uh, 12878 is referenced and there's a SNP in 24385, you uh, can mix those. So for example, in a 50-50 mixture, you would get 50% and 25% allele frequency, depending on homo versus heterozygous. And then start to titrate that lower. Um, so at 5%, you get 5 and 2.5% allele frequency. At 1%, you get 1 and 0.5, etc. Um, one important thing to remember here is, is you get to these very low percentages is that if you were to say start with a 10 nanogram mixture of DNA, that's only 3,000 haploid genomes. Assuming completely efficient conversion of that into library and that you sequenced everything that was in that sample, which generally is not quite the case, you at 0.25% you have only seven uh, instances of the mutant allele. So you're really starting to butt up against statistics here. and so. Uh, to go to these very low ends, and especially if you want to go to 0.1% or lower, you really need to think about adding more uh, DNA so that you uh, actually get representation of the mutant alleles. Okay, so now going back to the, read, uh, the adapter structure and then what the resulting read structure looks like, uh, we're, we're sequencing on uh, MySeq. So here's the uh, adapter structure. We have uh, the P5 sample index, the P7 sample index, and then the UMI here. The first read off the sequencer is uh, read one of the, and it's the uh, genomic insert. The second read off the sequencer is going to read the P7 sample index, and then after those eight bases, six more bases of uh, the UMI, and these are six degenerate bases. The third read is then going to read the P5 side sample index, and the fourth read is uh, read two of the genomic insert. Uh, so off the sequencer, you'll get your um, base call files, then demultiplex based on the sample indices, map those reads. Uh, we use BWA mem for our mapping. And then using the UMI information, you can, after mapping, group reads by the molecular barcode and then do additional analysis, which I'll explain a little bit more in a second, um, whether that's a consensus calling or uh, deduplication based on, on the UMIs. Okay, so now going into the analysis, um, the next slide has this in pictures, but I'll just you know, briefly describe first. So uh, we made libraries that were captured with a custom XGen lockdown probe set that covers 288 common SNPs, and then the, the total target area is about 35 KB. The reason we chose this is given our, our model system, this gives us uh, a lot of true and false positives to be able to um, get a better assessment of, of our real sensitivity. We did our variant calling with uh, um, open source variant caller, Vardict, which was uh, developed by AstraZeneca. And importantly, we used a th threshold for the variant calling of 0.25%. So this is uh, what is chosen here will significantly affect your sensitivity and your specificity. So it's important to uh, make sure this is correct and also um, to know what this is when you're talking about false positives. Uh, so then there, there are three forms of the analysis, which I'll describe in pictures in a moment, but just briefly, there's a standard analysis where you just ignore the UMIs, uh, remove PCR duplicates based on start and stop sites. The second level of analysis uses that UMI information to um, figure out what happens to look like a PCR duplicate because it shares the same start-stop, but uh, because your sequencing so deeply actually represents another unique molecule. And then there's the real error correction that happens with consensus building. So this is where we uh, see multiple reads from the same starting molecule, which we can identify due to the UMI, and then uh, build a consensus and use that for variant calling. Um, so showing this then in pictures, here I'm showing a read pile up against the genome where true positives are in, red, are in green and false positives are in red um, with an, a 
traditional analysis, what you would do is um, remove everything with the same, all but one read with the same start-stop site, assuming they're PCR duplicates, so you'll pick the best quality read <coughs> um, for each position, throw everything that's out. Um, so with our data set, they give us almost 3,000x coverage, and if you look at sensitivity and uh, PPV, so we had a sensitivity of about 99.5% in that case, um, because it's with, especially with a variant frequency threshold of 0.25%, it's not hard to find variants. What's really hard is to actually distinguish the green and the red, in this case, the true and the false positives. So you can see that our PPV is quite poor at under 30%. And the way I'm defining this is the true positives over the um, true and plus false positives. So we had more than 600 false positives over our 35 kb region uh, in this scenario. So then the next level of analysis is to um, start using the UMI information. So in this case, we can see we had different um, reads that have the same start-stop but actually originate from a different initial starting molecule. So now we do our uh, PCR deduplication with that UMI information. So we're able to uh, keep more reads. Let's see, we have uh, more coverage in this case. You get a little bit better specificity, but you haven't really done any error correction per se yet. So um, in order to do that, you need to start building consensus. So for that, we group reads by the, the UMI, and then we throw everything out that didn't have at least three reads uh, with the same UMI. So this is what we call family size. Uh, and three, um, and I'll show you a little bit more data on going to bigger family sizes, but three already has some significant error correction. And you now can use those three to essentially vote for the correct sequence. So uh, you're able to then start to correct for sequencing and, and PCR errors that are not present in, in all of the reads from that same molecular barcode. Um, that brings you back down approximately to where you started with coverage, so we're at about 2500x. And now you can see what happens to the uh, PPV. So with that consensus calling, we, we retain sensitivity above 98.5%, but our false positives drop dramatically, and we have um, over 99% PPV. Uh, I'll show you that in numbers here. So with the starting analysis, no UMIs, just start, stop, deduplication, we call 641 false positives. So our sensitivity was 99.6%, which is great, but that uh, comes at the cost of a bunch of false positives. Now, using the consensus, we drop the false positives to only two over that 35 kb region uh, and keep the sensitivity above 98.5%. Uh, showing this in a slightly different way, uh, what I have here is the called allelic frequency in that initial analysis not using UMIs, and on the y-axis is the allelic frequency called from the consensus analysis. So the first thing you notice is that these are well correlated, which is good, they should be. Um, have the true positives in blue and the false positives in gray. And so the second thing you'll see is that you really don't need a UMI to do germline genotyping, right? You can call these 50% uh, variants easily without a UMI. And the real trouble in action happens down here. So blowing up that region at below 2.5% allele frequency what you can see is that without the UMI, you have uh, a fairly good number of false positives, particularly down in this 1% range, and you, you can't distinguish them from the true positives. But with the consensus calling, you're able to now separate out the blue and the gray populations um, and, and determine what is a true versus false positive, uh, even down below 1%. So looking at the error reduction by base, there are some uh, signatures one generally sees in next-gen sequencing um, in, in terms of uh, higher error rates due to uh, sample prep, et cetera. Uh, so one of them is a C to A, G to T transition. Um, and you can see that with the standard analysis and the UMI analysis without the error correction, those stand well above everything else. 
but then with the consensus calling, you're able to drop that significantly along with all of the other error rates as well. Um, so I talked a little bit about family size earlier. Uh, we had this original um, sample here in green uh, with uh, slightly smaller family size distribution because of the number of reads we'd thrown at it. We then took a separate sample that we sequenced alone on the sequencer to get deeper coverage, so we were able to shift to larger family sizes. And when you do that, you can see um, what's on the x-axis here is the minimum number of reads you require to see in that um, UMI family to build a consensus. So we were at three in that previous analysis here. And you can see as you shift that larger, you can see this um, C to A transition fall even further down in line with all of the others. Okay, so conclusions. Uh, without UMIs, it's, it's really hard to figure out what is a true positive and what is a false positive. So you can get sensitive detection, but at the cost of not actually knowing what um, is true versus not. Uh, and this is generally true below about 5%, especially below 1%. Addition of UMIs to the ligation adapters allows you to uh, distinguish what appears to be a PCR duplicate because it shares the same start-stop site um, versus, uh, uh, rather than uh, actual PCR duplicates. And then you can use those UMIs to build read families uh, to get consensus reads and significantly increase uh, the variant calling accuracy. So with minimal changes to our sensitivity, we're able to drop the false positives by about 300-fold. So considering variance um, with that 0.25% uh, variant frequency threshold, uh, our PPV increased from 27% to over 99%, and we kept the sensitivity above 98.5%. Uh, All right, so I think I'll hand it over to uh, Hans now to uh, moderate the question and answer portion. Okay, uh, thank you, Mirna, for the presentation. And uh, I'm just going to point out one thing really quickly. If you look at the GoToWebinar control panel in the chat box, there's a link to the slides for today's presentation. Uh, if you don't want to look at them now, if you want to look at them before we close this out, we can. Uh, we'll also be sending you the link by email. So don't worry about you know having that today. But it's available to you today on our SlideShare site. Uh, the videos will be up in the next day or two. Um, to our YouTube and Vimeo channels. If you haven't already done so, you can type your question to the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel, and uh, we'll start taking those and we'll get through as many of them as we can before the uh, top of the hour here. So we do have a couple to begin with, and uh, I'll get started. So Mirna, the first question that we have is, is there a maximum size for the panel design when you only have about 10 to 20 nanograms of DNA? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, the amount of DNA actually does not limit the panel size. It's really the amount of um, sequencing that you're that you're able to throw at the sample that's going to limit how large you want the panel to be. So, with with a given amount of input, say you know 10 nanograms, you'll have a certain maximum depth depth of sequencing you can achieve um, based on the complexity of that library, but that depth will be consistent for a small or a large panel. Okay. Uh, the next question that we have, this is an interesting one. Um, is the UMI method possible with environmental samples where you're not looking at the homogeneous sample from the same species? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. It's it's sort of analogous to a mixed tumor population. So um, yes, it should be able to um, help in in that situation as well. I would think it's it's not something that we've done, but it's it's an interesting application. Yeah. Uh, next question that we have is, uh, can you describe a little bit what the tools are that we use for the data analysis? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so we used um, tools that are all open source. Um, so some of these come from the Picard suite that probably most uh, bioinformatician people are, are familiar with. And that's, um, let me actually go back to the analysis here to kind of walk through. Um, so for this um, 
step of sort of UMI aware demultiplexing. There are tools in uh, Picard that um, can help you do this for various different read structures. Um, for then the grouping and consensus calling, we worked with um, Fulcrum Genomics, which is a, a couple of ex Broad consultants who are amazing. Um, to, to develop some tools for this, and they've open sourced this through uh, their FG Bio suite and GitHub. And um, I, we can follow up with um, specific recommendations over email if, if people want. Okay, sounds great. Uh, the next question is, so we've, we've shown them the, the UMI method here. Uh, how would somebody go about getting XGen lockdown probes with the UMIs incorporated into them? Uh, yeah, so the um, the UMI actually is not in the XGen probe, so it's the same probes you'd use for a non-UMI library. The UMI is in the adapter. Got it. Uh, so, yeah, so you would, um, we have a lot of customers that order various custom configurations of adapters, custom sequences, um, so you should, uh, we can follow up over email, but we, um, we and your salesperson can help you figure out uh, how and what to order. These are custom uh, adapters that are ligated at an earlier step before you use the lockdown probes to isolate right. the sequences that you're interested in. Yeah. Okay. Um, for doing the target capture, are there any uh, like contaminants or inhibitors that people should worry about before they do the hybridization? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Let me go back to the workflow. In general, by that point, you've already made your library, you've PCR'd it, so any contaminants from the original sample really won't be an issue. Where those might come in is more in the generation of the library itself. Um, most of the library prep kits have taken into account some of the more standard um, contaminants, but it's kind of beyond the scope of this, so maybe we can follow up uh, over email. Okay. Uh, all right. The next question that we have is, what is the sequencing sequencing depth that's required to get three reads per UMI with the 35 kbp panel? Mm. Yes, so a good question, and it will depend on how much input material you put in. So generally, when we're sequencing libraries, we don't like PCR duplicates. Um, we look for low duplication percentages to get um, deeper sequencing. In this application, you actually are trying to get PCR duplicates because it's those um, duplicates, so reads from the same UMI that you're using to build consensus. So with lower inputs and less complex libraries, you can get larger family sizes with less sequencing. So, uh, hard to give an exact answer. Again, we could follow up over email, uh, but we had about um, 10,000 X coverage on, on these samples. Uh, okay, so the, the person followed up and asked if you have a 10 nanogram input, can, can we be more specific about that? Yeah, I have to go back and look at the exact numbers. Um, we can follow up. With the yeah, percentage. I think we had maybe three to five thousand next on a ten nanogram sample, but we, we can follow up. I, I'd have to check. Okay. All right. Um, so at the moment, we have reached uh, the end of the questions that I have. Um, so if you have something, please type it in. Um, give people a second. All right, another question. So how does our workflow size select for the desired 100 to 500 base pair fragments? So I guess that would be for the library preparation. Yeah, so that's um, it's actually up front of our workflow. This is in the library prep. Um, the most common way of doing the fragmentation is with covariance sharing, which in um, the process itself actually gives you a fairly narrow size distribution, and depending on the um, conditions, you can tune that to different sizes. Okay. Uh, what what kinds of DNA samples have we tested this out on so far? 
Yeah, so what I showed here was the genome in a bottle set, so that's genomic DNA from uh, Coriel. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, and we have also done some more uh, recent work with, um, with FFPE and with cell-free DNA. And so one of the things, um, let's see if I can find the, here. Um, so one of the things that we found, and as you might expect, is um, because this method of UMI ligation is really doing error correction for sequencing and PCR errors, which are the highest uh, percent errors normally, um, it, you see that you don't get quite as much error correction with a sample that has uh, degradation, so like FFPE, for example. You still get significant error correction, but it, you'll be left with a residual error rate that's higher due to damage to the DNA. Uh, and that's where you would really see uh, benefit from something like uh, duplex sequencing. Okay. Um, is there any uh, difference in design for FFPE samples? Difference in design. Um, uh, I'm not sure specifically yeah. what part of the design you're talking about. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Let me see if they clarify that. Is the method that you presented, is it duplex sequencing? No. No, it's not. Uh, there's only a single UMI. You, you don't have the dual UMI that um, ties together the top and bottom strand. So with the uh, increasing sensitivity that you have displayed here, once you incorporate that uh, the UMI into it, does it matter whether you use the the amplicons versus the sheared libraries as far as accuracy at that point, as far as the deduplication step? So if, if you were um, able to get a UMI on the amplicon, no, you you could do that. Um, it's there are some methods out there to try to get UMIs in uh, amplicons or molecular inversion probes. With uh, standard PCR, you, you can't just put it, a molecular barcode on your primers because you continue to make copies of copies. And so um, there's some methods out there um, one can look in the literature, uh, but it's not trivial. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting question. I actually don't know what this means, but I hope that you do. So, have you encountered barcode collision? I might need a clarification. What I know what that means in the 10x context. <laughs> to, do, All right. Well, yeah. we'll see if they if they can clarify that a little bit. I'm not I'm not sure what they mean by that. And that is actually what I have at the moment for questions. Okay. So we'll give it a second here. Um, also, I just wanted to point out again, you know, that we are recording this. Uh, and if you do have any other uh, questions, uh, Mirna, actually, do you mind going to that contact slide at the very end? Yeah, I can do that. I just want people to be aware of the email address that's on there. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, you have that uh, application support at idtdna.com. And that email address, if you have any other questions here that you, know, that you don't know how to get through the webinar or uh, you, know, you want more details on something, you just email at that address. And they will either answer your question or will find someone who can. So uh, it's, a, it's a great place to uh, start if you have other questions. Okay. Um, well, at this point, uh, we've got a few minutes left, but there's nothing else coming in for questions, and uh, I think we will wrap up. Uh, we'll be sending you links to the uh, recordings of the webinar later, so if you want to look at any of this again, or you know, watch a particular part of the webinar to get more details, then you can do that. Uh, you'll also get a link to the slides. The slides is in your chat box right now, but you don't need to remember that address. You can click on it now and go there. But otherwise, we'll be sending you links to that. We'll also be sending you links to any. Uh, we'll be sending you an email as we have other webinars on next generation sequencing topics, which we plan to have in the next few months. So um, be be on the lookout for those, and check out our YouTube channel and uh, Vimeo channels, which will be linked in the email that we'll send to you.
<laughs> and there's all kinds of great content there on a variety of molecular and uh, biology a a applications. Um, all right, Myrna, thank you again for the presentation. And thanks, everybody, for participating and asking great questions. And good luck with your research. Thanks, everyone.